Hello and welcome back to the second day of the very first annual symposium of the Water and Development Partnership Program. We had a great start yesterday with some powerful speakers and engaging discussions along with our fair share of technical issues. Uh, we thank all our participants, panelists and speakers for their patience. We still have some people joining in. But in the meantime, we can do a little recap from yesterday. Uh, we began yesterday with discussing advocacy for impact, uh, where we heard passionate presentations about science communication. Our speakers discussed how us as water professionals can extend the findings of our research to wider audiences by collaborating across sectors and creatively using communication tools and how this can impact policy and what are the challenges faced in this process. The second half of the day was about technology for impact. Speakers shared the struggles of moving away from top-down technological solutions to water issues toward collaborating efforts of adapting technologies to the needs of local, especially marginalized communities? How can scientists and academics demystify technology and ensure that community perspectives are included in the inception of projects when problems are identified and formulated? Today, we have another two very insightful sessions planned for you with a total of six presentations. The first half of the day, we'll see discussions on diversity and inclusion, the varied interpretations of these terms, and the multiple ways of putting them in practice. And the second half of the day, will reflect on struggles of sustaining projects and their impacts beyond project timelines. Once again, we hope to share stories not only of success, but also of failures, of uncertainties, and of what we don't yet know. If you have not yet received the symposium program, please download it at the link that my colleague Deborah will share in the chat. And before we begin, I have a few points of housekeeping. We encourage you to use the chat freely and interact with each other through the presentations. But if you have a question for the speakers, please put it in the question and answer section, which you will find in the Zoom toolbar at the bottom of your screen. When you pose your question, please make sure that you indicate who your question is posed to. At the end of all the three presentations, there will be space for a discussion and reflections. During this time, you can raise your hand and um, we will give permission to speak. Um, if you have questions in French, please feel free to ask them as well. Uh, we will translate these for the panelists. And with this, I will begin introducing our first moderator for the day. Maitri Mukhopadhyay. Um, Maitri Mukhopadhyay is a social anthropologist and feminist. Uh, she's among the very first generation of gender trainers, researchers, and advocates. Uh, based at the KIT Royal Tropical Institute in Amsterdam, she led the KIT gender research, advisory work, and teaching and training for 21 years. Um, I'm personally very happy that Maitri Makapadia has agreed to join us today, and I'm so excited to uh, hear how she moderates this session. Maitri? Thank you. Thank you for having me, and welcome, everybody. Um, our topic is diversity and inclusion for impact. Um, I, I just would like to pick up a few points about the title itself. Uh, we have three projects that will be discussed, and each of them has um, in the intention to make the uh, to include a diverse diversity. So I uh, will address uh, make two points about the diversity. Um, it, as you see in the title, it's diversity and inclusion for impact, and it in a certain way it looks it's a bit off because it seems like a justification 
yet another category like all other categories in international development that we coin and we mobilize in order to justify that our projects are worth it. It's, it sounds instrumental. So there is a, a, a justification to incorporate this. Um, diversity and inclusion as consideration and impact, uh, as if that is the main goal, uh, impact is the main goal. So if diversity and inclusion work for that, then well and good. But diversity is also used in other ways. And I'm talking about social diversity here. Um, diversity and inclusion is also an, has an intrinsic value. Diversity is ubiquitous in real life. It's the stuff which, which our societies are woven. But because the dominant classes in a given society hold the power to set the norms, the world gets organized around their needs and interests. And the voices of the less powerful remain submerged and invisibilized. Now, the literature on diversity um, that I've drawn on primarily comes from organization, behavior, and management studies and educational studies, both show a positive correlation between diversity and performance. However, public programs to include historically marginalized groups, for example, in higher education, um, race in the US and caste in India, are undertaken because it has intrinsic value. These programs not only benefit minority students who gain expanded access to elite institutions through affirmative action. Rather, diversity also benefits students from the dominant race or caste who grow through encounters with minority students. It contributes to social and intellectual life on campus, and it serves society at large by aiding the development of citizens equipped for citizenship in an increasingly diverse world and country. In social research, our task is to visibilize the needs and interests of those groups in society for whom the development initiative is critical, but who are generally invisible to the mainstream. The question is how the research design uh, or the project design incorporates voices less likely to be heard, but most affected by the program. The projects to be discussed today have all mentioned, as I said, diversity and inclusion as intention. The three projects are uh, uh, farming in times of crises, experiences, responses, and in needs of smallholder farmers during the COVID-19 pandemic in Morocco, Algeria, and India, Maharashtra. This is the only completed project in the three. Um, Water-based livelihoods is the second one. Urban development and climate change in two port cities of Colombia. And this has, project has just begun. And finally, sustainable water pans in Tanzania. And this project has also just begun. There'll be a question and answer uh, session, as um, uh, Ayn has pointed out. Uh, we'll give priority to clarification, uh, at first to clarification questions, um, not addressed in the presentation, but not only. That's just in between, we can allow a few clarification questions. Um, but we want to focus really on how is diversity and inclusion addressed in the projects? How is it intrinsic to project design? Not in, only instrumental, but interest, interesting, uh, intrinsic to project design. The, the politics of diversity and inclusion, including who is considered marginalized, in which ways they prefer to be included, et cetera. And how is paying attention to diverse marginalized perspectives shaping goals uh, in all three projects and outcomes of their project for at least one project which has been completed. Now with that, I would like to call the, ask the uh, uh, presenter for farming in times of, price, uh, times of crises, 
to please give us her presentation. Hi, good afternoon. So I will, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, great. So I will uh, um, share my screen for the slides. Is it working? Can you see it? You can see it, right? Yes. Okay, yes. perfect. Then I can start. Irina, we see your screen, but it's not a full screen. Yeah, it's not a full screen. What do you mean it's not a full screen? It says your screen sharing. Yes, yes but we see the presenter view. We don't see it as uh -huh. a full screen. That's a... Uh... Okay, wait. Stop share. Let me see how I can do this. Because I am. Be mm. share your screen and select the full screen. Share sound. No. Okay. I have only one option, select a window or, or basically. Yes, screen. when you're selecting the window, select the first window, which is screen. And then in your PowerPoint presentation, mm -hmm. when you go to slideshow, it should show us the full screen. Is it correct now? Yes. Yeah. Right. Okay, perfect. Then I'll start. Uh, so. Um, yeah, my name is Irene Leonardelli, and um, I completed in May a, a PhD at IHC Delft. Um, and uh, yeah, during the years of my PhD, one of the projects I was involved in, um, I co coordinated, was this uh, um, farming in times of crisis experiences, responses, and needs of smallholder farmers during the COVID-19 pandemic. And it's a project that was active from June 2020 to December 2021. Um, so first of all, I would like to give you some background information about the project um, by telling you why this project was developed. So in March 2020, um, I was conducting field work for my PhD research in Maharashtra in India. Um, and I was studying smallholder farmers living in a drought prone rural area, um, mostly focusing on their ways of managing water and mostly focusing on women farmers' practices and experiences with water. Then suddenly the COVID-19 spread around the world and uh, lockdown measures started to be implemented everywhere. And I had to fly back to Europe. With some colleagues who were also doing research on rural agrarian transformations uh, and working with smallholder farmers in different countries of the world, uh, in India, in Morocco, and Algeria. We were holding regular uh, online meetings to share insights about the COVID situation in our research areas and to stay connected because we were all working remotely from home. So although the COVID-19 pandemic was affecting each country in different ways, we, sh we were sharing similar concerns about the challenges that different smallholder farmers were facing during these times because the markets were closed and many couldn't sell their produce anymore. They had to leave the, the harvest uh, to, to rot on the fields or agricultural laborers couldn't travel to their workplaces, to the farms. So we were wondering and worrying about how different smallholder farmers were dealing with the situation, um, how they were reinventing their everyday um, organization, how they were re reinventing their livelihoods in these troubled times, and if they had access to government programs. Uh, to, that were there to support them. 
Um, and above all, we wanted to understand if there was something we could do, if there were some strategies, some programs we could develop to support them. Um, so we got funding by the DUPC2 for, to develop this small uh, project. And the main objective was that of ensuring that the voices of marginalized smallholder farmers in Morocco, Algeria, and India were considered in policy and aid interventions during the uh, COVID-19 crisis and its aftermath. So the partners involved in the project, um, you can see in the table, it's uh, uh, this NGO in Morocco, um, another research agency in Algeria, um, an NGO in India, Sopicum, and then IHC Delt uh, uh, coordinating the, the project in the Netherlands. Um, the diversity of the partners, so in, involving both uh, research agencies, research institutions, and um, uh, the civil society was very important to to implement the project and to um, and to have the outcomes we we had. But I will talk to you about this later on in the presentation. So just uh, to specify where uh, exactly the project was implemented, here is a map with uh, with the areas. Um, so in uh, in Morocco. Um, we focused on the Dra Valley, the Saiz Plain, and the Gar Plain. In Algeria, um, we worked in the Mazab Valley, and in India, as mentioned, in the Maharashtra states, different uh, different villages in, uh, in Maharashtra. So uh, the activities we were able to implement in the context uh, in the context of the project uh, included. So first of all, research. So we collected data on COVID-19 related experiences and impacts um, across cases. So we did about 15 telephonic interviews with different farmers in each country, because at the beginning, um, also the local partners couldn't travel to the field. So we had to um, conduct uh, remote field work through uh, phone interviews. And then when um, it was possible to move around uh, different countries, the local partners conducted some field uh, visits to monitor the situation and conduct some more in-depth interviews with the people that we had already um, talked to uh, through the phone. And then in India, uh, we also conducted a survey um, together with the, with the local partner which works with a network of uh, women leaders, women farmer leaders. And uh, yeah, we were able to conduct a, a survey involving about uh, 1,000 single rural women. Um, then we disseminated the data we collected and we analyzed through academic articles and blog posts and podcasts. Uh, and we uh, developed some strategies to, to support uh, uh, the small older farmers uh, to build COVID-19 resilient uh, strategies. And also policy advocacy uh, was part of the, um, of the activities um, implemented in the context of the project. Now I would like to say uh, something more about these activities, activities focusing on the theme of the session, which is impact for diversity, uh, discussing the importance, but also the challenges related to two specific aspects of diversity that were important in, the, in, the pro in this project. So first of all, the diversity of smallholder farmers involved, and particularly our, de our de decision to focus on uh, those most marginalized, uh, and then the diversity of the partners uh, involved. So, of course, the uh, category of smallholder farmers is, is broad and it means uh, something different in different countries, in different contexts. Um, but what we wanted to do was to remain sensitive to how experiences and responses to the COVID-19 pandemic differ am among different smallholder farmers. And we wanted to be particularly sensitive to our existing patterns of inequality shape these different experiences and responses. Um, 
This is also because we wanted to, to develop support strategies that could uh, particularly help uh, the most marginalized, uh, those farmers that were suffering the most uh, the effects of the pandemic. Um, so in all three countries, in, in India, Morocco, and Algeria, um, patriarchal social structures uh, interwave with class and the caste system to constitute institutional and social dynamic dynamics in which single women farmers and agricultural laborers from scheduled castes are often the most marginalized and discriminated. In fact, our data suggested that women, and particularly women from disadvantaged uh, uh, castes and classes, were particularly affected by the, the, by the pandemic because they found it very difficult to find paid agricultural work and to reach the farm uh, during the lockdown. And also uh, they struggle to access government supports, support schemes. On top of this, there was clear, a clear increase in care work, in caring, caring tasks that they had to take, that they had to take on as children, for instance, weren't going to school um, during that time. Uh, so we aim to listen and document particularly the voices of, uh, of women in our academic articles, in the blogs, uh, in, the in the podcasts we produced, and to, and to support their needs to ad advocacy work and uh, also provision of, of agricultural inputs. Um, it was easier uh, for the to collect data, to collect rich data in uh, in Maharashtra and in Morocco because the local partners there had uh, already um, a wide, a broad network of contacts with uh, with women farmers. They were working with women farmers before the COVID nineteen pandemic. So also contacting women farmers through phone interviews was, was relatively easy because we had many contacts there. It was more difficult in Algeria because the partner organization there um, before the COVID-19 pandemic was conducting research on rural agrarian transformation, but without uh, a specific focus on gender issues without really applying an intersectional approach. So for them, it was more difficult to reach out to, to, to women. Um, also during the field visits. So if, if contacts with women farmers were already established, then it was easy to contact them and to understand the challenges they were facing. But if contacts were not there, it was more difficult to go to the villages and, uh, and meet them because of all the restrictions uh, um, that, were, that were there. Um, so this was one of the challenges I wanted to uh, talk about. And then I wanted to uh, focus more on, uh, um, on the importance of involving different partners. Um, so it what we not we but the local partner the local NGO in uh, in Maharashtra India was able to to develop actual programs to support women farmers, um, because they had this broad network of uh, they were in contact they were already working with this network of women farmers leaders and activists, and they were conducting advocacy work for for many 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 years. Uh, so the activities they were able to develop uh, included um, uh, promoting chemical uh, free kitchen gardens. So around 200 single women farmers were provided with agricultural inputs, uh, including um, small land seeds, uh, uh, irrigation tools to build their kitchen garden and to start cultivating household crops for their own consumption. Uh, this helped them to be a bit less dependent on commercial crops, something that was particularly important as markets were closed. Um, also, Sapakum, the NGO in Maharashtra, was able to um, organize capacity building workshops to grassroots organizations and women leaders activists to increase women farmers' access to a government scheme that aimed to provide uh, um, work to women. Um, also before COVID, but this was especially important uh, during COVID times. So 
workshops uh, uh, serve to create awareness about the scheme and to explain how to get uh, the cards, the right documentation to access uh, to access the scheme. Um, also, the partner NGO SOPCOM was able to organize several meetings with government officials uh, and politicians to conduct advocacy work, to explain, uh, um, to, to spread also the data we collected through the project, uh, to explain why women farmers, especially single women and uh, women from uh, disadvantaged caste classes were, um, uh, were facing um, specific challenges in these times and how they could be, they could be helped. Um, because the partners in Morocco and Algeria were more focusing on research and advocacy work, they weren't, a, they didn't develop uh, programs like this, like uh, these free kitchen gardens or capacity building workshops. Their activities uh, focused more on conducting advocacy work, uh, writing policy briefs, uh, writing articles in local newspapers to make the voices of uh, smallholder farmers and particularly women farmers heard. Uh, yeah, so to conclude, uh, um, I think, yeah, the. Um, um, what we learned through this project was definitely the, the relevance, the potential of the collaboration between research institutions and local practitioners and activists. Um, as, as we have learned, uh, uh, especially in Maharashtra, India, the fact that the local partner already had a broad network uh, of uh, contacts with um, women farmers leaders and activists was fundamental to um, to support more um, more smallholder farmers to reach out to more smallholder farmers in different areas of the region and to implement actual uh, programs actual uh, small projects to to support them and uh, and of course because uh, I, for instance, couldn't travel to, to, to the field like I was doing before, before COVID. Um, and I could conduct only, only phone interviews. It was extremely re relevant to have uh, and important to have um, local partners that could travel to the field as soon as it was possible and actually meet the people and uh, see how the situation was um, on the ground because of course you can get many information through phone interviews but it's not the same as going there and actually meeting the people talking to them see what they need and uh, and support them um yeah for instance we know that two years after the implementation of this project many women farmers are uh, who participated in the uh, um, kitchen gardens programs are still uh, cultivating uh, the gardens. Of course, not all of them. Some stopped after one year or so, but others uh, are still uh, using that support and um, and also started to rethink a bit cropping patterns to cultivate more um, household crop for the family. <laughs> and um, and yeah, and we kept working with the same uh, partners. Hi, Irina. Um, sorry to interrupt you, but you are uh, four minutes over time. Okay, I I, I finished. <laughs> I'm done. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Irina. Are there any questions for clarification before we switch to the next panelist? If so, please put uh, your hands up. Only clarification. Okay, there's uh, one in the question and answer, which I think Irina could uh, type um, answer. It's uh, what are the success stories 
uh, you would like to share to us at a uh, learning lessons. It's from core from South Sudan. Yeah, so I think I I I mentioned some success stories by uh, by mentioning some of the of the activities that um, Subcom this local NGO um, was able to implement in these uh, in these times, and these um, these activities were um, were developed because we. Uh, collected in depth rich data on the situation of different smallholder farmers uh, applying an intersectional approach. So really making sure that, um, yeah, trying to understand who was most affected. You no, know? uh, looking at uh, looking at social existing patterns of of inequalities. So focusing on gender, on class, on caste, on age. Uh, uh, and then the programs were developed uh, accordingly, and uh, and I think some of them were um, were really successful, as I as I mentioned, um, the two hundred uh, women. Okay. Who, yeah. Can we um, yeah call it there? Then uh, we move on to the next person as thank you. time progresses. Thank yes. you very much, Irene. We're moving on now yes. to the next speaker, please. Hello, how are you? Um, I am uh, Parisa Rinaldi presenting on behalf of the Water-Based Livelihoods Group from Colombia. Um, my presentation um, is focusing on our framework for thinking about transdisciplinary research um, through this idea of diversity as not only an add-on um, and um, if a, a thing to, to kind of include in our projects, but as a unifying um, method and understanding of the need for unity in diversity to reach truth, to um, establish research questions and to develop cycles of action and reflection uh, with those involved. Um, so the title is Unity and Diversity as Transdisciplinary Method, Building a Framework for the Amphibious Water-Based Livelihoods Project. And um, just to begin, I'd like to um, introduce the project. We call it the Amphibious Project um, endearingly because the father of participatory Research Action in Colombia, Orlando Falls Borda, studied the communities in the Atlantic region of Colombia and gave them this, um, this name of, of being amphibious because they could easily work and live um, fluidly with a fluid relationship with both land and water. And so the communities that we are working with in this project are um, communities, mainly fishing communities in, in these two port cities, Barranquilla and Buenaventura, Barranquilla and the Atlantic coast and Buenaventura and the Pacific coast. Um, these two cities uh, are the major port cities that uh, export um, are nodes of the fossil fuel economy. So they export all sorts of products, but mainly oil um, from the country. And the development of the ports has really affected uh, the uh, ecosystems around the port and the base of livelihood for the fishing communities that are historically um, present in these areas and, and are also racialized um, communities. So in uh, DUPC2, um, as the previous presentation mentioned, a lot of those projects were done during the pandemic. Uh, my team also had a project in these two cities um, addressing water access, uh, gender, and also um, the, the impact of water access on dengue and mosquito-borne diseases in these two cities. And they also had to kind of adapt to the pandemic and um, the pandemic forced them to actually enter into more participatory methods such as um, doing uh, 
autoethnographies. So they they sent uh, they trained groups of women in these two cities. They sent them um, cell phones, and the women kind of um, researched their own everyday lives and and uh, were able to speak about how their access to water um, was uh, had had these differences by gender. So this kind of precedent um, allowed the research team to think about now that we are working in the same cities, thinking about the impacts of climate change, sea level rise, climate relocation, development policies, um, and wanting to really focus on the resilience of these communities. How can we move from just a participatory, you know, research method of um, uh, data collection to really having a uh, a project that serves the 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 needs of the community. Um, so this is how we have entered into the amphibious project um, with the aim to highlight the adaptability and resilience of these coastal communities whose livelihoods depend on, on both land and water. And how do we understand diversity in, and, and its role in this project? Um, we, we see the need for um, diversity to, to really be intrinsic and to be driving our path forward. Um, so we really hold on to this concept of praxis and climate justice um, and praxis as being kind of in, encouraging cycles of action and reflection uh, as well as research, but in an unfinished collective way that um, kind of breaks down dichotomies, breaks down binaries, um, and intertwines both theory and practice and both community needs and uh, investigation and um, community-based question questions. Um, and these are some of the ideas that also arise in terms of climate justice from this uh, praxis lens. We do not just see um, sea level rise as a problem, right? It is interconnected with these other issues of pollution, ecosystem degradation, the port development in these two cities, the livelihoods of the fishing communities, um, tourism projects that are coming in and displacing communities, urbanization, um, and also all of this connected to um, communities' economic development. So we were able to just very recently in October launch this project with this, uh, with a kickoff training, um, gathering, and um, also development, collective development of the research questions with uh, 15 members of each uh, of fishing communities from each city. And we chose um, our partner Fundaek, which is the foundation for the application and teaching of the sciences, which has over 50 years of experience in Colombia, as well as uh, across the world in developing rural education um, programs, um, and have really developed a framework for understanding capacity building based on an understanding of uh, development as both material and spiritual. Um, Fundaek has developed a um, training on reconceptualizing leadership um, that draws on moral leadership and an understanding of historical consciousness that now we're in a in a different um, time when all of us need to be uh, moral leaders and uh, in, in every aspect of our lives and professions and community uh, relationships. So we partnered with Fundaek and uh, asked them to give this training to us. And we were all participants in this training, both um, the research team, the academic research team members and the um, community members and students that we've involved in this project all participated. And one of the main um, uh, kind of learnings from this training was understanding um, the need for all voices to be heard. So as each one of us thinks about facilitating as moral leaders, facilitating learning in our communities, whether they be in these cities or in the uh, in academia, how can we really serve uh, and not impose our will on others? 
and allow uh, the voices of all to be to be considered and um, consulted on to determine um, our paths forward. So we use this kind of method of consultation with the steps that Fundayek offered to determine our research questions at the end of this training. We were able to do this in this beautiful space, uh, the House of Worship, the Baha'i House of Worship in um, Cauca, Colombia, which is a space that is open to all walks of life. Um, so people had the opportunity to reflect and meditate in between um, in between these training sessions. Um, um, you have two more minutes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So this is a, just an image of the, the training, our uh, collaborator from Fundayek presenting. Um, we were able to, as I already mentioned, talk a lot about this concept of unity and diversity um, through the exercises in the training um, and also develop this concept of praxis as cycles of consultation, action, reflection. So here on the last day, um, we you know, came together, shared all of our questions, and we organized them across these four main research themes um, that the project has, so which is everyday resistance and resilience, spatial and temporal transformations, ecosystem degradation, water quality, and discursive strategies. So for each theme, we had a paper where we put out, we kind of decided where each question that was arising could fit. Um, and people signed up to you know, form research teams around these questions. So just to give a sense of one of them for resistance and resilience, some of these questions came out, the need to document the life stories of leaders and community associations um, in these communities, to answer the question of specific cases of internally displaced communities, how have these communities sustained their fishing livelihoods, and also discursive strategies of um, uh, laws that have been implemented that consider biodiversity, but also um, prohibit the fishing of um, certain species that are part of the ancestral diet. Um, and so just to conclude, the training was pivotal to starting this project. It really brought us all together and, and sparked many other uh, ideas and collaborations that are um, associated with this project. And I'm sure that we will um, be very um, successful moving forward um, with our next steps. Uh, we'll be having a methods workshop. We're also incorporating a uh, collaborator who will be doing a microfinancing workshop to help the groups uh, with, with the projects okay. along with yeah. the research. I think yes. you've reached, uh, thank you very much, no? Marisa, uh, that's great. Um, can I, um, yes, uh, I'm looking at whether there are any questions uh, for you immediately. Um, there aren't any. So I think, uh, thank you, and we'll discuss some issues that you have raised in the question and answer session. Uh, along with the others. Shall we just move on to the next speaker, please? Hello. Hi. Hi, Maitri, would you please introduce the next speaker? Yes. Can I? Yes. Um, can I just introduce uh, the third project, Sustainable Water Finds in Tanzania? And I believe, is this Ellen? Yes. OK. Ellen, please um, uh, begin. Thank you very much. Present. And on back. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Let me briefly share my screen. All right, you can see my screen. Yes. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, Maitri, as you mentioned at the beginning, our project has only just started. So actually, today, we do not want to talk too much 
about the project itself. Um, but the Sustainable Water Plants project was started by a group of collaborators who have spent several years questioning the logic of empowerment and our way of working with marginalized communities. So today we want to spend this opportunity to share some of that type of thinking that has shaped our project, both from the perspective of a local grassroots CSO and of um, a development professional, namely myself. Speaking for the letter, um, I think many of us noticed that the increased demand for diversity and inclusiveness in our work uh, is rather challenging. Um, I know that as especially being called privileged is one of these terms that has made a lot of professionals very defensive. But actually, if you know the debate, the term privilege actually just means that we can live our lives without dealing with a specific problem that somebody else has to overcome. Now, for me personally, working with poor marginalized communities actually first and foremost meant to phase up to the full reality of what that term privilege means. It means that in my projects to generate impact, I have to make plans for realities that are completely outside my own experience. The quote I put on that slide you are seeing is from a social mapping interview we conducted just last month for the Sustainable Water Pants project to appreciate the full reality of the context we are working with. Now, in this example, we have a young woman that is trapped in a catch-22 that most people I work with or from our culture cannot even begin to imagine. But to create impact, it means that when our project works in this community on capacity development, or when we promote the formation of an inclusive uh, water pan committee, impact actually means that our solution has to make a meaningful contribution to the reality of that young woman. Now, what does that mean for us and how we approach our projects? First of all, I believe is that we have to understand that diversity does not create impact if it is limited to enforcing quotas in artificial spaces. And project meetings, trainings, project contexts are almost always temporary and artificial. Therefore, to me, one of the keys to impact and diversity is to work with partners that are actually an integral part of the communities that we aim to work with because they are the only ones who can really reality check our suggestions and who can teach us lessons that we need to overcome our own blind spots. Now, in my case and in the case of our project, the Mara Women Empowerment Assistance is such a partner. Um, so I would actually like to stop here already and hand over to my colleague, Mzamba Chacha, to share some thoughts and what it means to work with donor-funded projects from his perspective. Thank you very much, Ellen. Uh, um, I'm representing Moya Marami Environment Assistance, which is a local grassroots NGO rooted in the local community. And this is providing micro loans with a strong social focus. Over the last two decades, Moya has uh, positively uh, influenced the lives of over 10,000 individuals through comprehensive initiatives. Uh, including training programs, advocacy efforts, microloans, and various forms of social support. So drawing from this experience, uh, I would like to offer a piece of advice to the coming project. Uh, when engaging with marginalized uh, communities, it's vital to know that uh, within these communities, there are people who are hungry for success but they, are, they live in a system. Uh, once they are given something or they are training, they are dropped back into this completely dysfunctional system where nobody is believing that change is happening and they are left there. Where do they go with their knowledge? So um, in, in, in a specific uh, community where we operate, an investor with very good intention sought to 
assist a, a group of women in produce water filters uh, to diminish uh, charcoal and, and firewood consumption in boiling drinking water. So regrettably, from the outset, the group was not adequately informed about us, uh, accessing materials, pricing, and marketing strategies for the filters. So tragically, the investor passed away, leaving the group struggling with production. So despite having the necessary machines and a well-prepared site, the project remains inactive. It's not working. So yeah, from, from my experience, uh, a notable challenge is that uh, many professionals initiating projects often fail to recognize the beneficiaries as individuals with human needs. So instead, they focus solely on metrics and statistics. So in a discussion with uh, about inclusivity, our local field officer suggested a simple yet profound change that when projects interact with individuals for the first time, why not ask for their names? This small gesture acknowledges the humanity of the beneficiaries. You know, just imagine, uh, for example, if me as Msamba Chacha visit and knock your door and tell you what to do. Will you be able to accept without even building trust, knowing anything about it? So um, in our approach to work, uh, one of the key elements is not to, to look who is in the room, but uh, what are they doing? So central to this one, uh, this concept of agency. So agents means uh, emphasizing that individuals should be in control of their own lives. Uh, for, for example, uh, in a local consultation, if someone rejects a suggestion that you have brought to them, <clears throat> do project leaders have the flexibility and space to adapt change? Will you change your project? Or do you have space to change your project? Who is in control? So I think it's essential to question who holds control in these scenarios and to ensure that the community members are active participants in the decisions that impact their lives. Thank you very much. I, I would like to, to turn back to Ellen for the continuation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Mazamba. Now, reflecting on this um, local perspective, but then also bringing it back to my own reactions to, to realities that I've seen, one of the most important lessons that I've learned from working with colleagues like Mazamba and the beneficiaries of my own projects and the Veronicas or Mananyandas of this world I think one of the key things is that we need to look at is the need to question the status quo that we find, but together with people who are forced to live in the status quo of the situation. In situations that we do not understand, it is an easy reaction to just say that we need to respect the local culture or to advocate for something that we believe is positive, like certain forms of equality or diversity. But seeing the famous cartoon on this slide, um, I, I think at least in water circles, it is quite uh, famous. There is a common first reaction that simply says that the women in this slide, in this cartoon, should be seated at the table where the decisions are made. However, if you really think about it, making decisions at that table has created the system that marginalized the women in the first place. So, Hopefully the debates of the last few years have clarified that also Western societies are not half as inclusive and equal as we normally like to believe. So if we simply ask to add women to the bench in this cartoon, does it mean we are increasing diversity? Or in that local context, does it mean that we are just adding yet another job 
to women's workload. So as development professionals, I believe we also have to face the fact that bringing resources into existing systems might stabilize hierarchies that marginalized locals would rather change or even break. So this is something we have to ask, how do we account for that when we measure impact? Now, coming from the very philosophical to the very practical, maybe just one thing that, that um, I think all of us in our project believe in is equality, diversity, and inclusion in any context requires some rather uh, uncomfortable conversations. But mostly, the increasing impacts through diversity starts with our own mindset. The key is to look at our own proposals through the eyes of what we call beneficiaries. Now, as Mazamba suggested, about two minutes. think about if you were one of those beneficiaries and you know somebody knocked on your door with your own attitude and your proposal and said, here's what I want to bring you, give you. Would you actually let that person in? And do you, did you want to be part of that project you're proposing? Santa Sana. Thank you. Is that okay? Thank you, Ellen. This uh, I don't see any questions that can immediately be. Uh, answered in the short space. There is one which you could please type an answer to or leave for uh, later. What are the modalities? Just have a look at the question that is aimed at you. Thank you. Um, anybody else? All right. So we could go on then. Hello? Yes. We could go on then uh, to some questions and answers. And um, there aren't very many here, but some are very specific to what Irene has uh, each project. And I would request that perhaps those be answered by the presenter themselves. Um, yes, so, um, but this here's an, an interesting one from Kaur uh, uh, Kaur, uh, who asks, Ellen, what are the modalities your organization is able to use to identify marginalized women? Um, well, in our case, it's not just about women. Of course, the uh, beneficiaries are actually marginalized communities as a whole. Um, with all the beneficiaries. So the, the, the project itself um, deals with the way water pans are designed, built and operated um, because a lot of uh, African rural communities depend on them. Uh, so the, the question here is how is the community as a whole treated, for example, by political decision makers which we do by trying to do the process. So actually we start to try and build a water pan as the community wants it. So first of all, finding out who in the community wants what. So there we have rather complex um, processes to find that out at the same time doing researches to better understand the local structures, but then confronting actually the regulatory um, reality of saying, okay, here's what we want. Is it actually possible to give the community what they want? Or is current regulation and, and also governance practice not even able to have a conversation about what the community wants? So it's a, it's a lot of, you know, a very experimental process, a lot of participatory action research. Um, but I think I can't uh, explain all of it here. Um, but maybe that helps understand it a little bit. Thank you. Um, I think there's one for Masamba, which please kindly type an answer. Um, okay. I, uh, there aren't uh, very many questions and answers. So I'm going to just raise some of the issues that um, um, have been already raised and please uh, uh, you feel free all of you, not, not just the presenter, to actually uh, engage with uh, the issues. 
One of the things uh, that uh, Irene said was that, uh, um, uh, and, uh, um, that she also made us aware of while presenting was that diversity means um, actually different groups in different contexts. Given that she was working in three different countries and three different, very different situations, uh, although on agricultural workforce, um, the diversity uh, of uh, um, the diversity she was referring, social inclusion that she was referring to um, meant different things in who was to be you know, kind of, uh, included, what were how is um, in India as compared to Morocco as and um, and Algeria. So do you want to, um, Irene, give one example because um, um, where, for example, in Algeria, the other two places you actually had partners who were local on the ground and you were able to uh, work with them. Um, can you give an, an uh, idea of inclusion that was not that, uh, uh, I mean, is not even from your presentation? For example, from Algeria, I thought that was a very interesting case of kind, having read your article. Um, yeah, so over to Irene, please. Yes, hi, thank you. Um, yeah, as I said, in Algeria, it was more difficult to talk to women, mostly because uh, um, the local partner there uh, had conducted research um, on, on um, irrigation practices, on um, agricultural practices, but mostly talking to male farmers, because these are contexts that when you go to the to the field, as other presenters also also mentioned, um, it is most often men that um, speak up in uh, the public space and that have uh, important political roles. So it is more difficult to to talk to women. One really has to go and um, to the houses of people and mention, no, I want to know what what women think about this, what are women practices, what are women strategies around this issue, because otherwise you get only the perspective of men, which is, of course, very different because they have different roles, uh, uh, different tasks in the everyday uh, farming work, or they don't even go to the farm and all the work is done by women, but still it is men who decide about water management and who uh, then tells you how, how things work. Um, but yeah, again, in COVID times, it was a bit more difficult to, to go and uh, knock at the door of, uh, of farmers and say, hey, I want to talk to, to, to your wife, for instance, because People were also a bit more protective, no? They were a bit uh, more reluctant to talk to uh, researchers, to, pe uh, to people coming from outside uh, because of the health risks, mostly. Um, so yeah, we understood yeah, how, how relevant it was to build a network uh, um, yeah, before, before, the, before the pandemic started. But um, for instance, in Algeria, the... Uh, the local partner there, the researchers there, focused on uh, on migrants uh, from sub-Saharan countries uh, who were uh, um, working as agricultural laborers in Algeria, and they were also facing uh, particular challenges uh, because they are already uh, living in a very vulnerable situation in very uh, difficult conditions and of course the pandemic affected them uh, particularly so um, part of the of the research there focused on this group of, uh, of marginalized uh, agricultural laborers um, in in Morocco um, the researchers focused on, on young farmers, uh, particularly, because also they found out that these young entrepreneurs uh, um, cultivating watermelons were uh, also facing uh, specific uh, challenges. So 
I, I mostly focused on, on women farmers in the presentation, but there were other groups of marginalized people that we that we try to include in our in our study. And these of course differed in the in the different contexts. Thank you so much. That's great to hear. So diversity, in other words, uh, means different uh, um, uh, different groups in different contexts. Talking to, visibilizing, uh, that's what I learned from Irene. Um, Parisa, uh, I had a question. I mean, I wanted to, from what you said, I had, I had a, I would like to know more about uh something you said which is you talked about diversity as a unifying force um and that all voices had to be heard um but first of all diversity as a unifying force can you explain to us uh what exactly you meant by that yes um so i just touched on it very briefly but it of course is a very complex idea I think that we're still um, learning from in action but this understanding I think a lot of times people think of diversity just on the superficial level of as long as we have you know many diverse groups or um, even you know, perspectives voices present then <clears throat> then we've you know reached our goal but uh Actually, you know, in, if, if we we talked a lot about how um, you cannot uh, do any kind of generation of knowledge without uh, having diversity and diverse perspectives, but also building something collectively together, right? So making a decision as a group, taking that decision. Uh, acting upon it and then reflecting on how on on how that went. So then diversity does become a a unifying force through these processes of consultation um, because we all realize that we all need each other and that we there's no way that we can even understand an issue without uh, everyone's contribution. Um, and so of course, there's some principles there, how to, uh, share perspectives and um, identify what the commonalities, for example, uh, of, of perspectives, um, how to share an opinion in a, in a group consultation without being a, completely attached to that opinion being, you know, my will being imposed upon the group. So there are many things, kind of skills to practice in order to uh, put the, the concept of unity and diversity into practice. Um, but I believe it's it's an important thing to consider. Okay. Um, with um, Ellen, thank you very much for also. And you talked about diversity being challenging. And I was wondering for whom, and there is, uh, of course, diversity is challenging. There's a whole politics involved in 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 the way in which that uh, diversity is manifested, and what we do with it. So, um, um, the, and Denise also asked in your presentation. You spoke about how we engage with communities. Can you define this a bit more? So, obviously, it's challenging for somebody. Is it challenge? Uh, who's the we? <laughs> Uh, yes, indeed. So I was just typing the answer. Um, in So in my presentation, I was primarily speaking from the perspective of a development professional. So people who earn their livelihoods from implementing, you know, raising funds from donor funded projects and earning their livelihoods with it um, by supposedly generating impacts on beneficiaries that are do not live in our street, but somewhere else. Um, now, I think it is particularly um, applicable to um, a European academic perspective. Um, but I have to say, I also I have worked with a lot of African colleagues and uh, who, you know, African professionals whose personal life experience is just as far removed from the life experience of a rural subsistence farmer as my own. 
so also the, the idea that, for example, colleagues who happen to be born in an African country somehow automatically um, have full insight into a particular rural community. This is, I think, also something where Western professionals um, make a lot of assumptions about the realities. I mean, African countries and, and professional cultures, societies are extremely diverse as well. So not to jump to conclusions because your passport has the same nationality, I think is something that also needs much more understanding um, than we currently practice. Thank you. Um, but all three of you engaged with partners. Ellen, you also introduced a partner on the ground. Uh, Parisa and, um, um, and Irene also came to uh, recognize, to identify who they would, would work, work with because of the partners. Um, is that a way of actually trying to understand the social reality. I understand what you're saying, that somebody living in Nairobi or Dar es Salaam is not li likely to uh, know what the situation is for a, a woman farmer in who's widowed, as you say, at 21, um, in, a, in a remote village. But nevertheless, does it make it any easier? This is to all three panelists. Um, I would like to say that in, in our case, the organization that we um, partnered with had just such a tremendous wealth of experience um, and also in the materials that they had developed to be able to have these kinds of discussions um, with all, all kinds of, you know, uh, communities, mainly their experience has been in rural communities, but this particular Training had also been implemented with neighborhood associations um, in urban areas as well. And I think that um, that was uh, very, very uh, helpful in, in our situation to be able to take the ideas that we had, you know, the framework that we were developing, but then this organization had, you know, 50 plus years of experience actually um, having these conversations in a structured way based on a material um, and, and also in creating the kind of atmosphere that allows diverse perspectives to, uh, to come out. So I think that there are many different collaborations that can be done with these kinds of organizations. Irene, please. Yes, I, I agree. I mean, Without uh, local partners, uh, yeah, we wouldn't have been able to to conduct any of the activity. I'm speaking more about the um, um, Maharashtrian context because it's the one that I know best because I conducted my PhD research there and uh, in close collaboration with this uh, with this NGO. Um, yeah, and I can say that they they work almost on a daily basis uh, um, with women farmers in the villages, really in the fields, really uh, uh, working, listening, um, having conversations with, uh, with activists, uh, with uh, um, social movements, organizations there. So they, they know um, very much in depth what what are the struggles what are the daily challenges that uh, that these more older farmers face um yeah coming from outside and uh, also not speaking uh, the language working always with a translator is of course uh, very very limiting i yeah it, it's possible to implement this type of projects only because of their knowledge and because of uh, the expertise of uh, of local partners, yeah. Thank you. Yes, so, uh, do you want to add to what you said yes. already? I, I would like to add one thing here. I, I think it's not about, you know, having local partners. The point is, what are you trying to achieve and who has something to contribute? So I think my knowledge, you know, and 25 years of experience with certain things have contributed a lot of, uh, 
of insight to projects and initiatives that we have done. But the thing is, how do you combine who knows what and, and then to create an impact? So for example, just to, to mention one thing, in a last project I did that was you know, for capacity development in a rural area, but that was about activating communities to aim to solve pro more problems by themselves. Now, one of the things that we realized is that whenever a professional shows up and tries to train them in something, communities just don't believe they can do it. Because they say, well, if I had a degree, you know, I might be able to, but you know, I'm not used, so I can't do it. So one of the solutions we had is that every single person standing in front of the community teaching is a role model from essentially the next village who has done something. So they have proven that it's possible. And one of the key things was that I never showed up in the communities because the presence of a white person would have completely distorted every single conversation that happened. But nevertheless, to develop the concept, how to, to turn a person who has a story to tell into somebody who can teach others, you know, or tell the story in a way that they are able to follow it, that needed some very extensive work that also I think where I brought some expertise to the table. So it's not about the local partner knows more, is what kind of knowledge do you need to achieve something that doesn't exist right now? And there is no simple answer to that. This is where just asking lots and lots of questions starts to kind of, you know, create a picture that you then draw together. Okay, thank you. Um, I would like to um, just read out one, which is for all presenters, but it seems like something that is worrying at least one other person who has um, uh, asked a question. It's dressed up, it's written in a different way, but the yeah the, it's uh, but i don't want to take up all the time with this i just want your reactions to this question um so it says in a poor community as those you all are working on almost every person is suffering some kind of discrimination how do you select your target group for your intervention projects i'm asking this because Sometimes you have to focus on non-discriminated group to achieve more diversity rather than only focus on marginalized groups. It's kind of a philosophical... Well, it reminds me of all the debates around affirmative action diversity that have been going on for ages. So um, obviously this is a worry with many people. Um, that if you if you uh, seek to protect uh, uh, one group, which is disadvantaged, uh, other groups suffer. This is obviously some kind of uh, anxiety, and and it works in different ways in different societies. So, does um, do any of the panelists want to? Um, I think we're going to ask anybody in the audience want to. Um, talk to this? Who wants to begin? Obviously, this we're having a problem about who's going to begin. Um, I'm going to ask Irene if you want to start and then go on in the order of panelists, perhaps. I mean, I think this different projects uh, target different types of people. I don't, I don't think that all projects in one area, in one context, in one situation, uh, aim to help uh, the same few people who are, are recognized as the most marginalized. So it really depends on the on the team, on the collaborations that are built to implement a project. What are the what are the objectives? Uh, um, I mean, we, for instance, in the context of the project, um, we were a network of researchers, activists uh, doing feminist research and really trying to focus on, um, on this group, uh, women farmers, and um, yeah, we, of course, and also an intersectional uh, lens. 
um, because in water management in the countries where we work, they are often silenced or marginalized. So it was really something um, grounding our uh, research and uh, action interest, uh, let's say. But of course, this is doesn't want to imply that uh, other groups are, are uh, um, in need of other types of support that uh, that we shouldn't be careful to to include. Um, I don't know other other marginalized groups as I as I mentioned uh, before. Of course, there are there are other factors that need to. That need to be considered. I I think it's very important to identify who are the people who suffer the most and uh, and try to support uh, to support them. I don't. Yeah, um, I don't think that um, we should focus on. Uh, um, on who remains excluded from these uh, from these programs uh, necessarily, but yeah, I, this is what I think. Thank you. Okay, um, Ellen, I'd like to come back to you, but actually, I have five minutes, so I'm going to actually ask you to take only one minute of those five minutes, just not to give a practical solution, but to address the philosophical uh, issue we have behind this questioning uh, about this, this anxiety about what diversity might mean? Well, I think the answer to that is rather simple. Um, the world- no, we, don't, we don't want a practical answer. Can you address the question? No, a philosophical. I, okay. I think on a philosophical level, it's in a way simpler than one thinks because the world does not suffer because too many people want to make it better. So there are a lot of problems and none of us can solve them all. So I think the only thing we can do is we can find a problem where we actually think it is a real problem and we know from local voices that it is a problem and do the best we can to help make that better. Now, then, you know, if okay. millions of people do that for different problems, then overall it will be good, but nobody has to do it all. But what is important is that we learn enough about oppression, hierarchies, exclusion to understand if what we are doing actually by accident enforces a hierarchy that excludes others and have that self-awareness and reflection. That's more important to me. Thank you very much. And with that, I'm going to quickly wrap up and uh, um, call this session to an end. Thank you very much for everybody attending. Thanks for the panelists that uh, you were great and um, your presentations threw a lot of light on, um, on, on diversity inclusion, the politics of diversity, the politics of including which groups, how, etc. cetera. So um, thank you. And um, the question still remains, diversity does cause anxiety. It causes anxiety, especially if a uh, gender diversity, if you, want to include women because their voices are marginalized. This is causes a lot of anxiety. And so a lot of hypothetical situations will be presented as to why this is not necessary or that the other side suffers, etc. cetera. So um, this is basically the politics of diversity, but we have to hear the voices of those who are underprivileged and who do not have their voice represented where it matters. Okay, thank you very much and bye-bye. Thank you, Marcy. Thank you. And on that um, rather unresolved note, <laughs> As questions and discussions on diversity and inclusion go, we hope that uh, you will continue these discussions amongst um, your own project members, with your partners, amongst your friends, your colleagues. Um, and we thank you, Moitri, for moderating this session uh, and to our speakers for enriching us with all your insights from the field. Uh, 
Uh, we will now take a 10 minute break before starting the next session, which is called Sustainability and Impact. Uh, we won't close the session, so, so you can stay tuned and we start again in 10 minutes.